We're so thrilled to have Mary Sarah Builder, who is a professor at Boston College Law School and author of the Bancroft Prize winning Madison's Hand, Revising the Constitutional Convention. And is, she's the literary director of the Ames Foundation and a member of the American Law Institute and the American Antiquarian Association. I can't say that 10 times fast. And a fellow of the American Bar Foundation. Welcome. We are so thrilled to have you, Professor Builder. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. It's a great program, and I'm really honored to be included. And today we're going to be discussing your book on Eliza Harriet. And just starting off, could you tell us who Eliza Harriet was and what was her contribution to America's founding era? Yeah, so she's a person who really has been completely forgotten, although she was a person who George Washington knew of and a number of people uh, in the papers. She's probably the first female lecturer, public lecturer in the United States. She was the founder of ambitious women's schools that were then sort of adopted by other people. And very importantly, she gave lectures in Philadelphia in 1787, to which George Washington also attended. And she may therefore be somewhat responsible for the fact that the Constitution language is basically gender neutral. What new arguments do you make in the book about the founding era? Yeah, so I think if we think of the probably our stereotypical ideas about the founding, particularly the Constitutional Convention, we just imagine white men, right? So that's the famous pictures, These one of these is in the book that we see in um, the National Archives walls or in the House of Representative walls in the Capitol, all show a whole bunch of white guys writing the Constitution. And we tend to, I think, um, focus on what was going on inside the room. So this book is part of a much larger argument I've made that we need to think about the Constitution as part of a founding generation, a framing generation, I like to say, where we understand that all sorts of people were creating pressures, developing arguments, being aspirational, that that sort of contributed to the Constitution itself. So part of the argument of the book is reminding us all the other people who are there, even if they don't really show up in the room in the same way. Uh, and then another important argument the book makes is the title of the book. Um, I argue this was a period when this idea of female genius came into being, a sort of moment when some women imagined they could get rid of this argument that they were inferior and therefore couldn't be educated in the same way that men could and couldn't participate in politics. Now, what was specifically her impact on the writing of the Constitution? How did she aid in that? Yeah, well, I think it helps to figure sort of maybe we can backtrack and think about where um, uh, her story is. Um, you know, she's a, a kind of interesting woman. She's born in uh, Lisbon, Portugal to British um, parents, and she marries an Irish Catholic lawyer uh, in the 1770s, and actually in 1776. And they eventually come to the United States after the American Revolution, first in New York and then in Philadelphia. Uh, and in Philadelphia, she um, sort of does what she had begun to do, which is she gives lectures. Actually, her first advertisement for a lecture was 240 days, 240 years ago today. April 2nd is her very first ad. So this is kind of an anniversary um, of her. You totally planned that. Yes, exactly. It's really wonderful. Have me back in 10 years on the 250th anniversary. And her lectures, um, which she advertises in the newspaper, are sort of an ambitious understanding of what women can do. And I argue through her and her ambition about her lectures and her ideas about a, a female French and English academy in Philadelphia, people in Philadelphia were aware of this transatlantic argument that women could participate. And that when they went to write the Constitution and um, they basically had examples of gendered language. But the final constitution erases all that gendered language. Uh, and I argue that her model may have been in the background of people um, when they basically decided to get rid of some of that gendered language. Yeah, you refer to her in the title and throughout the book just by her first name. Tell us why that is. Yeah, I call her Eliza Harriet, and writing about women is always a struggle. What do we call them, right? So 
you know, but like if you write about Washington, you just call him Washington and he gets to be Washington in my in my book. But what do we call all the women in people's lives? If we use their last name, that tends to confuse them with their spouses. And so what often happens when we write about women is we give men last names and then we treat women with first names. And that can be kind of diminutive. But if we call her by either of her last names, her father's name was Barons, uh, and her husband's name was O'Connor, it sort of conflates them, her with her husband. And this was a problem for women at the period. When they married, they lost their legal and political identities. And so I decided to call her Eliza Harriet, which is her first and middle name. And that's the name she chose for herself. Um, there's five letters that she wrote that are still extant and her will. And in all of those documents, she signed herself Eliza Harriet O'Connor or Eliza Harriet. And so um, I sort of decided I would call her the name that she chose for herself. Her actual name was Elizabeth Harriet. And so she obviously went through life uh, as Eliza Harriet. And her husband just gets called John so that they're treated the same in the book. Washington does get to be Washington, but um, George seems a little overly familiar. <laughs> well, that provides a first segue because you mentioned Washington. What was their relationship like? How yeah, so he's in the title of the book for a number of reasons. Um, one, he's in the title of the book because he reminds us of the reality that white male political power is the sort of experience for most people. Um, and so she represents uh, people pushing against that, but it's really important to realize that there's this reality about who is uh, in control in terms of power. And she um, met him. She He attends her lecture in Philadelphia. She probably delays her lecture so that he can show up. Um, and she then um, meets him again. She actually uh, has a school nearby Mount Vernon, and she gets herself invited to Mount Vernon for five days um, in order to discuss uh, what she should do with her career when her husband uh, moves to Edenton. I think importantly for me, she's also in, he's also in the title because um, Eliza Harriet was incredibly sophisticated about recognizing the power that Washington had. And, and she understood his ability to amplify her message. And so um, she realizes that if Washington comes to her lecture, then she will be able to have that covered in the newspaper. And that's actually what happens. The fact that Washington goes to her lecture allows sort of her lecture to go viral in 18th century newspapers. So she's sophisticated about how to basically borrow his male political power and use it for her own uh, purposes. And to be fair, that's a model I used in writing the book. Um, if you write a book about Eliza Harriet, sometimes people don't want to read books about women in this period. They only want to read books about men. And so in some ways, right, to remind us that Washington is con in conversation with these people is also a way to remind us that women's history is just as much a part of political history as the sort of classic history around Washington. How much did her birth in Portugal affect her later life, her worldview? Yeah, it's a great question. She's really, um, I think she reminds us of, you know, sometimes when we do American history, we somehow, I don't know, imagine that no, everyone isn't moving around. But so many people are um, moving in this period. Um, uh, they coming to the United States, either because they're brought through slavery or because they are immigrating. And we sort of lose track of that. Sometimes we forget how this period is a period that if you could hear everyone, it would have been filled with accents and, and different pronunciations. And, and we sort of, um, sort of assume like somehow everybody's speaking the exact same um, place. So she's born in Lisbon, Portugal. Her family is part of the world of um, the aspiring English who are kind of trying to rise up by um, admiralty and merchants lives. And her uh, grandfather was um, an admiral and her uncle, Sir Charles Hardy, is an admiral. He will also be governor of New York and her other uncle is um, governor of New Jersey. So she's from a um, aspirational family and a family that is pretty sophisticated about the way you get ahead is you get important people to notice you. That may be why she's 
um, somebody who comes to the United States and instantly sort of tries to do the same thing. She sort of understood the power of political patronage. Um, and so her, her, her sort of birth in Lisbon, Portugal, um, reminds us of a sort of world where a lot of people are much more mobile than we sort of imagine they are. I mean, you sort of answered this a little bit, but I was wondering if you can expound a little more why she isn't as well known as other sort of even founding mothers from the period. Yeah, well, I mean, I think partly uh, we've tended to think about women in this period through the lens of being a mother, um, not she doesn't have children. If she had children, um, they died. Uh, so she's not remembered that way. We, we, the you know, the sort of Republican mother argument has become kind of characterized and we imagine everybody fits into that. Instead, there's actually a significant number of women who work. Obviously, that applies to women of color, but also a number of white women who are professional sort of working women or supporting their families. And, and so she doesn't fit into that um, older model. Um, she is, we know about her only through newspaper advertisements. And until recently, that wasn't a source that was very easy to um, get access to. So one of the wonderful things about the turn to digital history has been that it's very easy for people to access people whose economic um, sort of capacity allowed them to publish advertisements or to write to the newspaper. And this suddenly opens up a whole world of people who we didn't uh, otherwise see. So one thing that I like to do when we um, when I teach about the Constitution is we go to um, one of these big newspaper databases and there's lots of them um, now. One of the very big ones is through Redex um, with the papers of the um, American Antiquarian Society. And everybody picks a day from the summer of 1787 and reads the four page paper for that day. And then we all talk about like, what did we read? And one of the things you really realize is how much um, global news there is, how much international news there is, how slavery is very front and present in advertisements um, in this period, you know, you sort of come, you can sort of get people into that space in a way that that is kind of hard sometimes through a textbook. So I think newspapers are a wonderful source. And we see her there uh, in her advertisements. I wonder too, the fact that she didn't have children, did they not save then her correspondence? Was that part of it as well? Yeah, great, great point. I mean, it reminds us of how important it is in terms of who gets remembered are people who have um, families and not just families and children, but children with the economic resources to save things. You know, I mean, that's actually pretty tricky. If you're going to save papers, you need to have the economic resources to have a house. And you often need to have had the affluence to sort of keep possessions intact, or you need to be pretty famous. And so the, um, the government basically saves it for you. So she reminds us of how many people's stories really have vanished because of economic resources or the absence of children. And she's, you know, she's just really, really typical in, um, in that regard, like that, that sort of history is a little bit sometimes fluky because the people whose stories we know are the people who had economic resources. She's, I think, um, all, she, she, we can see her beyond her advertisements because she wrote um, four letters to Washington. And so Washington is uh, famous enough that his papers, like most of his papers, were saved. She wrote one other letter to Benjamin Franklin's daughter, um, Sarah Bage Franklin and uh, Sarah Franklin Bage. And so that letter also is extant. Um, but probably somewhere in the world, there's um, some other pieces. But if your name's Eliza O'Connor, not everybody keeps your papers. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, and she was progressive in a lot of her viewpoints. And what was her thoughts about abolitionists? Yeah, I mean, I would love, you know, if this were a, um, a, a sort of trade press book in terms of just being a little maybe more fluid with the history, one could have imagined um, uh, coming down pretty concretely on that. I don't know what she was about uh, abolitionism. And this is something I struggle with in the book. Um, how do we imagine this person who was uh, very progressive and pushing the boundaries with respect to um, what we would think of as sex and gender? How do we think about her with respect 
to race. Her husband's writing suggests that she was part of a reformed community who would have, for example, been against the international slave trade and would have wanted that um, to be barred, and who probably was against slavery, but we don't have any evidence of that. And in very important to understand that she moves out uh, over her lifetime progressively southward, ending up in South Carolina, and that in particularly Charleston and Columbia, where her schools were very successful, they were probably successful because she was a white woman who traded a little bit on what we would think of now today as white privilege. She was white, she didn't have to do the kind of domestic labor that she might have had to do somewhere else. Her school becomes more profitable because of the reality of enslaved labor. And being a lady, which is what she describes herself, in this time period is a word that is also used exclusively for white women. And so there's a way in which um, we have to be super careful not to convert her into somebody that we have no evidence for, a sort of passionate, uh, anti-abolitionist civil rights person. It does remind us that in the period at which she's in Charleston in the 1790s, there were people beginning uh, to work hard to teach uh, young people of color. Uh, and we see that because we see um, legislation coming to pass that actually bans mental instruction. Um, and so there are people who are obviously um, uh, trying to extend education to young people of color, but I can't know for sure that that's her. Absolutely. Well, and I know you're very passionate about primary sources, as we are at the Gilder Learning Collection. So I just wanted to ask you about this document that you use in the book, if you could just sort of tell us a little bit about it. I know, uh, you know, you use this document to discuss the relationship between the framers treatment of enslavement in the Constitution and African American women's agency during the founding era. And can you elaborate on how you did this? Yeah, this is a wonderful document, and I'm so grateful to um, the Gilder Lerman for letting me reproduce it uh, in the um, uh, in the book. So this is um, uh, Pierce Butler, who's one of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention. He was a, um, a significant enslaver and slave owner um, uh, from the South. And one of the things that we don't always remember about the Constitution is that the um, the convention that summer produced drafts where they tried to figure out whether they had the system right. And one of the very important drafts is produced in the beginning of August. And there's a lot of copies of that draft left. We call it the Committee of Detail draft. And that's what we're looking at here uh, is this Committee of Detail um, draft. And, and just, you know, if this is a new type of um, primary source for people, um, one of the things that I always like to point out to students is we can see how the text is on the right. And we have these big margins on the left, because that's just like today, they wanted to be able to edit it. And so the document reminds us about the sort of um, contested process of writing uh, the Constitution. Uh, and this is um, uh, what they did in August was they started adding back in and crossing out um, parts of the system that they didn't like or that they wanted to be included. And down in the lower right hand uh, corner where you have the highlighting is the moment when the convention decides to add a explicit uh, fugitive, what becomes the fugitive slave clause, uh, explicit statement that if people escaped, they had to be returned to the place that they were, to the person who um, basically was the enslaver who claimed to own them as property. And this is incredibly important to um, aspect, right? This is what will play out across the 19th century uh, in terms of eventually creating uh, and running up to the fugitive slave law in 1850 and the civil war. Because otherwise, if you hadn't had something like this, when people escaped, they might have been able to claim that they were free. And we know that happens in certain states in the 19th century. So if we go then within this place where we see this draft language that will become the fugitive slave clause, we can see that the language says he or she. And I think it's incredible that in this moment where a Southern delegate is saying we need to put 
language in to make sure that we can pull back to slavery all the people that we claim as property ownership rights over. They could not write this without explicitly imagining African American women escaping. That is the agency that Black women have is so powerful about their possibility of escaping that they produce the one explicit she in the draft. This is the only use of she that I know of in the draft. And it reminds us of people like Oni Judge, who will escape from George Washington in 1796, right? A wonderful um, uh, book about that. So, um, so we have this language, it's really important. It's um, uh, a wonderful moment where we can see, you know, a sort of story about the Constitution being drafted and also a story where we can see people thinking about women and we can see the people thinking about slavery explicitly in this, uh, in this space. What's interesting to me, of course, is this language doesn't remain in the Constitution. The she vanishes, the he or she vanishes. Uh, and in the final version of the Constitution, um, this language and a couple other places where um, uh, sex or gender is referred to, like Congress was originally called uh, two bodies of men, those all vanish. And instead, we get um, very um, identical language used in the Constitution where all people are described as person, person, and the pronoun that goes with that is he. And nowadays, we think of he as a uh, um, gender male pronoun, but in this period, it's not. It's actually a gender neutral pronoun. And we know that because um, the provision that says that if people who are criminals escape across state lines, um, he has to be brought back. And so otherwise, anybody who claims not to be a he can escape across a state line and not be brought back. So there's a really wonderful little um, piece of text that helps us see all sorts of things coming together um, uh, in the convention. And it reminds us, I think, really importantly about how the convention isn't really a black box, that it's kind of wrong to think that the only people who matter are the people who are actually in that room. They're, they're being pushed by all sorts of people and um, uh, movements that are outside that room. And this is a wonderful example of it. And also is a really great document for teachers to utilize in their classroom. It's a wonderful document for, um, I think, for teachers to use. I think it's a really great way that it opens up talking about both gender and race and the Constitution. And it reminds us how the Constitution, you know, it didn't, it didn't just get invented out of the blue. It was the product of a lot of compromise, a lot of contestation. And there were lots of things about it that people didn't agree about or even understand when it was ratified. So so I think it's a wonderful place where we see all of that um, uh, coming together. And I'm really glad. I know you have this available for teachers uh, on the website. And it's just a really interesting um, a sort of one, you know, if you had to pick one little moment uh, to use, that would be a great, um, that would be a great moment to use in class. Yeah. And we've mentioned about the school she founded. And I'm just wondering, can you share with us why those were unique? Yeah, so it's really interesting. I think this is another thing I know that when people teach, um, you know, if people do the A push survey or things like that, one of the things we're really trying to always tell our students when we um, read for context and read what does a primary document mean, that we have to think about, like, what is that word meaning, not in the way we understand it, but how people would have understood it at the time. So the book actually reproduces um, uh, some of the material around her schools and tries to think about, we might think of this as being sort of like, oh, this looks kind of like a feminine education. But at the time, it's not a feminine education. The things that she cares about are what late 18th century Enlightenment education cared about. So she thinks French. Everybody should learn French. Lots of people thought everyone should learn French because French is the great cosmopolitan language. And for women in particular, it lets women read sort of a lot of really interesting women, uh, women's writing. And she argues that everyone should learn to speak out loud, to basically do what's called the art of reading. And that was actually a whole movement designed to encourage people to learn to give public talks for all these new professions where public speaking was really important. So when we read her ads, we might initially think like, oh, this doesn't look like very much. And then when we unpack them, we can see that what she's doing is she's imagining women speaking 
in public in a very important way. And of course, if you can speak in public, then you begin to be able to be imagined as participating in the public space as a politician or as a senator. Yep. That reminds me of Pride and Prejudice. It feels very Jane Austen. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, that's where in um, when George Washington goes to see her, George Washington records that he went to hear a lady speak at the college hall. So that's all pretty incredible. There's no other woman I can find uh, who spoke at the college. That's now the University of Pennsylvania. And later on, when he goes back to rewrite that diary in the fall, when he goes back to Mount Vernon, he adds she was tolerable. And that's, of course, exactly the line that Mr. Darcy says of Eliza Bennett. And Jane Austen's only starts her her book starts what becomes Pride and Prejudice only about 10 years after Eliza Harriet. So this is the moment where all sorts of, of women and women's education, the rise of the novel, the young Mary Wollstonecroft's first book will be on education of daughters. And her second book will be a sort of um, pseudonym book that gives um, a uh, set of passages. It was called The Female Reader to encourage women to speak out loud. Yeah, I was also really interested about the unique business model she set up for her lectures. So you can tell us about that. Yeah, so one of the things that will always be hard for her is um, she doesn't have a lot of money. And uh, so she has sort of the um, knowledge of how you appear to have a lot of money because she grew up in a world with people who, you know, her uncle was a sir uh, and she had grown up visiting fancy houses, but she herself has no money. Her husband never makes any money. And so in order to um, start a school or or basically uh, give a lecture series, she needed to get people to um, give her money. And so she usually ran a subscription series where you would say I'm going to give five lectures and um, and pay me up front for the whole series. And then she'd have the money and then she'd just have to give um, the lectures. And she does this uh, when, um, when she goes to new places to raise enough money to found a school. And Granville Ganter, uh, Professor Granville Ganter, who's the only other person who's really written on her, he has this wonderful phrase to describe um, uh, people, particularly women, a little later on. He calls them entrepreneurial lecturers. And so you're giving a lecture as a way to make money. And, and in some ways, this will become very important for women in the 19th century. A lot of women will actually make money being lecturers. Yeah. Uh, so just for our final question, before we go to the audience question, uh, what is something you hope readers take away from this work? Yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's so important to me was she had a theory of the female example. And she actually writes in and adds the epigraph in the book that um, the exertions of a female, basically the, the hard work that a woman does, should be an example to be emulated and improved on. So not just imitated or not the highest thing, but the idea is that everyone who sees someone will be inspired but also inspired to go beyond that. And, and this is a whole theory for her of how you push boundaries, right? You sort of push boundaries by uh, somebody gets out there, they provide an example, but they don't, they're not ever going to be a perfect example. And so she herself argues this. And the book um, ends with a, a woman named Charlotte Rollin, an African-American woman uh, who accepts the invitation of the South Carolina legislature um, for a lady to come and argue for suffrage. And Charlotte Rollin is born precisely 100 years after Eliza Harriet uh, and lives in the same place that Eliza Harriet died. And so she argues for um, suffrage for African-American women and all women, but from this perspective of being a Black woman and what would Black women have done during the war, why they should be um, enfranchised under a constitution that she reads as gender neutral. And so for me, she sort of embodies in all sorts of ways this theory about the female example, uh, that any example of a person pushing a boundary doesn't have to be perfect, but is itself important in encouraging other people to sort of improve, to go beyond that model. Fantastic. Well, I'm going to pass you over to Nat, who's going to share our student question of the week and also the audience questions. Yes, absolutely. So as with every week, our first question, this Q&A, will come from our student question of the week winner. This week, it is Adam, who is a ninth grader from Georgetown Day School in Washington, D.C. And Adam asks, what are some important aspects of this book that can help us understand how to grow into a more inclusive country? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's such a wonderful question and it's such an important thing to think about. So one of the things this book reminds us about is that one, this is a period where um, we see this binary in some ways really created and challenged about the idea that somehow there's a category called men, what do we call anybody who's not a man. In this category, that word is woman. And so this is the rights of woman. We wouldn't use that language today, but that category woman is being created in this moment as a way to challenge all people being included. And so I think one of the things this book really reminds us is a long history on which people who aren't included in that category men are arguing that they aren't inferior, they have equal rights to participate. And when we look at the Constitution in this moment, even though we know that it's men, white men, many of them who owned people who created the Constitution, we can also see that the Constitution has ways of being read aspirational in this moment by people to include all persons, right? Not described by gender, not described by sex, not described by race, but all persons as belonging to the political community. And so she represents a sort of moment in the 1780s where some people really sort of had this ambitious aspiration to be very inclusive. They get closed down, they get pushed back, constitutions become a way, very powerful way to exclude people. But they remind us of this long thread of American history where people were always pushing against those boundaries. It's a great question. The next question comes from both Nora and Mary in the audience. And they both asked, how and when did you dis first discover Eliza Harriet? And what yeah, was yeah, it's a, such an interesting question. I wrote a book on um, uh, James Madison's notes of the convention, where I where I pointed out the last part of the notes were written um, two years after the convention and really tried to explore what it was like uh, to be in the convention. And I read a lot of diaries from that summer. And one of them is um, George Washington's diary from 1787. And I kept he wrote about this woman who who gave a lot he went to hear this lecture by a woman and he said she was uh tolerable and i kept thinking every time it kept floating around my you know i wrote a book that was just about men there's not a single woman in that book and i kept being like what was this woman doing and very importantly how can we understand what she's doing in a way that helps illuminate um, uh, the convention. And so for me, it was just this, just couldn't quite forget that little entry of a, of a diary. And so you make this quite um, new argument in the book that Eliza Harriet had a big, or you know, this link that she, she perhaps inspired some of the gender, gender neutral language in the constitution. And Jeff asks, what evidence in particular did you lean on in order to prove this point? Yeah, so what the book tries to really argue is it, it, it steps back to the late 1770s and 1780s and sort of points out that um, uh, particularly in London and Ireland and France, and then also in the United States, you see all sorts of arguments made by people about women should be able to participate in politics. So just to give one example um, that I think a lot of people probably aren't familiar with, uh, there's a period of time when there are lots of female debating societies in London uh, in uh, basically the, the 1780s, and they explicitly, repeatedly um, debate why shouldn't women be able to participate in politics and uh, serve in parliament. Um, there is a young man who, give, who graduates from Princeton, uh, president of the um, uh, debating society there. And in 1783, he gives uh, um, uh, his sort of graduating address to George Washington and most of Congress, where he argues for an expansive female education. And again, women could basically govern. So we see that argument floating around a lot once we start looking for it uh, in surprising in surprising places. And then I don't have, you know, there's no smoking gun here. It's really just the argument that we see this um, gendered language in the drafts of the Constitution. We see someone in this space who's um, repeatedly arguing for this kind of idea about female genius that women aren't inferiors. And we see the drafting language change to be open to the possibility uh, that, um, that women can participate. And we know this isn't 
fake because in New Jersey, women and people of color vote under a New Jersey constitution, which also was uh, neutral. And women in New Jersey, there was, was a wonderful exhibit at the um, Museum of the American Revolution about this. And this is another wonderful document for teachers. Uh, women vote, women and people of color vote up till 1807 uh, in New Jersey, where they are, when they are excluded under claims of voter fraud, um, mostly because they um, did not vote for the sort of new uh, Democratic Republican Party of Thomas Jefferson. And, um, and that's all reversed. But the New Jersey example of, um, of women voting, and there's wonderful poll lists you can see online uh, with women's names on it, reminds us that this isn't it's not outside the realm of possibility. It's actually a thing that happens, a very important thing that happens. We forget about New Jersey voting because it doesn't fit our narrative in which like people are supposed to wait their turn um, uh, to get political rights. But actually there was this moment where lots of people had could have had political rights and that moment then gets closed down in the 1790s into the early 19th century. The next question comes from Linda, and she wonders, as far as you're able to track this, how is Eliza Harriet received by other women in America? Yeah, it's such an interesting, uh, uh, such an interesting question. In Philadelphia, she um, reaches out to a group of women um, who she says supported her lectures, and one of those women is um, Benjamin Franklin's daughter, uh, Sally Bage Franklin. She actually, that's what she writes her, and she's actually asking her to help her um, found this very ambitious uh, female academy, French and English. English, um, Academy. So we have that little piece of evidence. And then we have evidence that um, that some women who were like her, who were working for employment, supported her uh, in at least two of the places that she gave lectures. One of the first places she advertises that you can get tickets um, is associated with a uh, uh, female run business. So very importantly, she goes um, uh, to Baltimore and gives lectures there. And the woman who sells her tickets is Miss Goddard. And that's Mary Catherine Goddard, who's the very important female printer of the Declaration of Independence. Um, she's the first person to print the Declaration of Independence with the signer's names. And she has, it's actually, that's another wonderful document. If people are looking for another great document, uh, it's the Declaration of Independence. It looks like what we think the Declaration of Independence is with all the um, male signers' names underneath it. And then at the very bottom, it says printed by Mary Catherine Goddard. And that's actually an image in the book also. Um, and so, um, so she supported uh, by um, by sort of other women. And she explicitly wanted a female audience. Um, she actually says the tickets admit two women and one man. And I'm not really sure how, like, I don't think anybody was policing the doors or anything, um, but she wants a female audience. And she actually also argues um, when she runs schools, she gives sort of a weekly lecture. And she says that lecture is so that women who are more mature, who didn't have an opportunity to have an education could come uh, and, and learn things. So she's, she's sort of sees herself in that space. That's a good segue into Eliza Harriet and schools because we had a lot of interest in the Q&A about this topic and we've got yeah. a few questions on it. So one from Sandra who asks, in her schools, who did she hire as educators? Were they men or women? Um, were there pay disparities, for example? And what type of education did her teachers have? Yeah, it's such a great question. And we only know about this from her um, uh, from her advertisements. So in her early schools, she seems to be the primary person. She just, um, she's sort of stuck because her husband's always got a new idea and then he kind of takes off and she eventually has to follow him. Um, so every time she kind of gets the school up and running, then um, he takes off and, and, and she follows along. Um, so in her early school, it's mostly her. Uh, her husband does sometimes say he is gonna teach also, he'll offer French or something like that on the side. When she gets to Charleston, she runs a quite successful school for a couple of years. And there she has a whole um, like little academy and she lists, um, she includes um, uh, a man who was teaching at the Charleston Academy uh, and she's teaching uh, ge uh, geography and also astronomy uh, and mathematics. And so she's teaching subjects that we tend to associate with male schools with the same 
she actually calls them faculty that are being used um, uh, you know, at male schools. The one subject she doesn't teach that you would see at um, male schools was Latin, but Latin's pretty controversial in this period. And um, for example, George Washington is like, don't teach my nephew. She, he was in charge of his, uh, I think, nephew's education. And he said, that's just a waste. Um, they, they should learn French or something like that instead. And so she's, she's an excellent part of this modern um, modern education. It's really interesting about um, pay disparities. Uh, one doesn't one doesn't know that she does hire um, somebody who's sort of like supposed to be a, a second level, um, you know, like a younger person working and, and we just don't know enough. Um, we just don't know enough about that. But it's a really important reminder of how education will rapidly be for women. Um, one of the few occupations where you could have a job and not have to get married. And a little bit later than her, right, we see this about 10 years after her, there's this remarkable um, a rise in female education. Mary Kelly has written a lot about this, right? We see just this incredible number of um, schools. and. And what that means is for most of those schools, those are schools being run by women. And that means each of those schools is an opportunity for a woman to also have a professional career. Great, and you mentioned Sh Charleston, South Carolina. Cheryl asks, why these moves south? Why did she establish a school there? Uh, and how does this play into her marriage and her move with her husband? Yeah, I mean, she'd lived there as a little girl. Her dad, uh, for a brief period, was, a, was the, um, sort of person appointed by the British to be the um, uh, sort of charge of the expanding post office. He doesn't side with the British in the right way, so he's eventually removed. Um, but Charleston may have been familiar to her. Charleston, um, because of its culture, because of the significant, um, you know, it's a city that's very built on enslavement uh, in this period, was very used to sending people back to England to be educated. And so if you imagine her with a um, somewhat of a British accent calling herself a lady, she sort of represents that aspirational um, culture. The um, Some of what's happening is she's probably racing from debts and she just keeps moving south along the main road that ran through um, the English colonies, English um, a new English states then called the King, what used to be called the King's Highway. And it's the same road that George Washington will travel. And she just keeps going, kind of jumping ship and going to the next, um, uh, the next city. But I think for me, really importantly, um, she reminds us of the ways in which um, for, for white Americans, for people like her, um, they're some of what allows them to expand boundaries is built on enslaved labor and on an economy around enslaved labor. And the book thinks about um, what did it mean to be white and to claim to be a lady in a place like Charleston. Uh, and um, Charleston's a place um, with a significant amount of enslaved labor, particularly enslaved labor uh, that could be hired. So there's lots of ways in which um, someone like her is gonna be able to the economics of her success is linked to a culture of enslavement, to the enormous enslavement that surrounds her uh, in, that, um, in that period. And so, so there's a way in which um, uh, she's borrowing on the terrible reality of slavery in, in her success in Charleston. And so linking with you know, status and education and identity as a lady, Rosie wonders if you could elaborate a bit more on Eliza Harriet's own education, where she was educated and to what level? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, when she first moves to New York, she says that she will run her school in the model of a Mrs. Aylesworthy uh, from Chelsea. And she probably went to that school. It was a quite prominent school outside of London in a town that had become known for female education and, and particularly in some ways for a sort of a feminist style female education. And she's precisely the same age as um, two young women who we know were at that school. Uh, one of them was the daughter of John Wilkes, and John Wilkes is sort of the um, great uh, sort of uh, we would now think of as a civil libertarian political protester reform person. And his daughter is at that school at that time, and so is Tobias Smollett, um, the um, the sort of uh, 
uh, writer's daughter. And they and so in essence, she would have been friends with them at that period. But but this question really allows us to think about how that model that she brings, which is this sort of um, slightly feminist model out of England, was not the model that was available in the United States. And so one of the things the book also argues is that um, a text that probably a lot of people teach in American history, which is um, Rush's, uh, Benjamin Rush's uh, sort of thoughts on the education of daughters, basically. Um, uh, I argue that he wrote that to try and drive her out of business. And you can read that as an argument that's pushing against this kind of um, ambitious education. And, and then we start to think like, what's he arguing ought to be, quote, American education for women. It's a very limited education. And if you go back through that text, which I think a lot of people probably teach, it shows up on AP exams, right? You can start to see how what Rush is arguing should be American women is a, is a very, very constrained type of education. And he writes that in um, July, right after she's argued for in the newspapers for this very ambitious type of female education. So it's a great question. Next question comes from Darren, who asks, can you elaborate on your process for digging into women's history from the period? How do we teach students to read between the lines in their research, but also not jump to conclusions based on the limited sources and records at the same time? Yeah, it's such a it's such a great um, it's such a great question. I, I think, you know, I think one of the really important things um, to understand about women's history in particular, it's obviously true of all history, but there isn't one type of women's history. Like women in this period are um, um, caught in so many different situations. Obviously, uh, for women who are enslaved, that represents one type of reality. Uh, for women who are married and who don't work, that's another type of reality. Uh, for women who are um, lower class and actually working all the time, that's another reality. And Eliza Harriet's sort of represents um, a, a white woman not part of, um, not married to a successful man who's supporting her, uh, and this kind of economic sort of trying to be somewhat economically independent. And so I think one of the things that's really important when we think about women's history is um, is sort of opening up that there's lots of different women, that, that sometimes we think women and then we all have an image in our minds and really reminding people um, to sort of deconstruct um, that idea of women. And then I think this goes back to the, I think the very important student question, when we think about what does it mean to be woman to be described as women's history, um, we're obviously talking about um, a lot of different ideas also. So I think that sort of beginning to think about what did it mean to be woman, women in a moment where a gender binary is very much how society's arranged? And, and how, do, how does thinking about women in this period really help us see pressures on that gender binary, the way people are pushing that sort of gender or sex binary? I think that's a really important thing. And then I guess lastly, I think it's really important to recognize that words that come to be associated with women get to be devalued over time. And so we have to be careful not to devalue them looking backwards. So a, a great example of this word is um, uh, ornament, uh, which makes us sound like, well, that can't be very serious. Um, but ornament is actually a really important word. It doesn't originally mean something quite so useless. And so if we uh, even use a tool like, for example, the Oxford English Dictionary or something like that to just look a couple words up and think about at that time period, they might have originally meant something much more powerful than they come to mean because they get associated with a certain group of people and those people get excluded. So, I, so for me, those are the kinds of things, the kinds of tools that are really important when we talk about uh, women and gender history. So many great ideas there for teachers to use. Thank you. Um, we've already mentioned so many primary sources that you might not have more to offer, but Kathy was wondering whether you had any other primary sources you would just you would suggest for high school teachers to utilize in their classrooms about Eliza Harriet or following on from that conversation we just had, other women during the constitutional era. Uh, 
Yeah, so I think um, like a great text, and again, I think it's part of, it's been used as one of those, I'm probably going to get it right wrong, but like DBQs or whatever the, whatever the thing is on the AP exams, you know, where they give you the little quote and then you describe it. I think a um, document that a lot of people love that's also in my book is um, Priscilla Mason in 1793, um, her speech at the Young Ladies Academy. So for people who are unfamiliar with this, and that's very readily available, um, uh, across um, uh, the web. Carolyn Eastman's written about this. Um, in 1793, um, the young woman, Priscilla Mason, gives a sort of graduating speech. Uh, and, and she's, this is only five years after Eliza Harriet's been there. So, so I wonder to what degree is, could she have seen Eliza Harriet or have heard Eliza Harriet? And um, it's at the academy that Benjamin Rush was associated with. So um, she's speaking her graduation speech at an academy where the covers of the notebooks that women were told to use told them literally that they should not aspire to be all of these important things. Like they just shouldn't. That was on the front page of the notebook. And then um, the text, I'm just going to read it because it's such a great text for people. You know, this is 1793. This is a young, very young woman in her graduation speech speaking to a mostly male audience. And she says, uh, supposing now that we possessed all the talents of the orator in the highest perfection. So that's the art of reading what Eliza Harriet's been talking about. Where shall we find a theater for the display of them? The church, the bar, and the Senate are shut against us. Who shut them? Man, despotic man, first made us incapable of the duty and then forbid us the exercise. Let us by suitable education qualify ourselves for those high departments and they will open before us. So this is an incredible, you know, just one couple sentences out of this amazing text in 1793, allowing us to think about, wait, this is a young girl who's saying, why can't I be in the church in a powerful position? Why can't I be in the bar? That's lawyers. Why can't I be in the Senate, the government? It's because men have barred us from education. If we can be educated, if we can show we're capable, then of course we will be able to be part of the government. And what I think a text like this allows us to do if we really think about it, like I have my students sometimes read this out loud and people like get really into it, right? Like, you know, like man, despotic man, right? And I mean, it's pretty incredible if you imagine what it would have sounded like in that space. Like I think nowadays, if you are 15 years old and you give this as your high school graduation, there will be some people who think it's not appropriate. So. So you go back, cycle that back a lot of years and say something like this, and it's pretty radical. And then one of the things you can do with this is think about like, okay, what barriers are there? And in 1793, constitutional barriers are just beginning to develop. So only after this period will constitutions move to describe who's eligible to participate as white male citizens. That's not encoded in the very beginning. The power structures encoded that way, but constitutions in this period don't yet un uniformly say that. That's going to be a development in the early 19th century. And that allows us all sorts of space, just this one little passage, to begin to think about what's the narrative we tell about the United States uh, in terms of who's included who's excluded, why are they included and excluded. So that's a document that I just think uh, is wonderful, Priscilla Mason's um, 1793 speech at the Young Ladies um, Academy. And I know that's really well um, avail widely available on the web. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to uh, link that and, and try and paraphrase a comment by Carol into a, into a question. But Carol says that women speaking in public was pretty, she says, out there in the 19th century that you could be classified as promiscuous or dangerous right. by male figures, by male audiences. Um, how did women like Eliza Harriet or her contemporaries navigate this sphere and kind of overcome it and work through it and produce such powerful rhetoric and texts and work? Yeah, I mean, it's such a great question because we don't we don't really know. I mean, um, 
Um, we see it briefly in the 1780s in England when women have um, these debating societies and they call them by names like the female Congress, you know, um, uh, the female parliament. So they're ambitious, but those, the government starts cracking down and those, and those kind of fall away. Um, and Eliza Harriet's really the only person I know of in this in this space. But one of the things that um, Mary Wollstonecraft talks about and, um, and, and the, book, the book goes into this a little bit is she argues that it would be good for women to have an excuse to what she says, obtrude themselves on the public. So, so it's sort of like, like you might need an excuse to do this. So um, educational exams where women, this is one of the things Eliza Harriet pioneers is that girls should give um, uh, sort of public examinations where they say things and they, they declare, you know, they declaim poems and things like that. And that's all a way of women having an excuse to be in the public and the rise of these female reader books, these books where women were sort of, uh, sort of learned passages and spoke in public in some ways, are efforts to try and um, allow women to speak in public without, without being completely harassed. Now, one of the things in the 19th century that's going to happen, right, is that's going to become um, feminized and less powerful. Um, and they're going to not do political things. They're going to start just doing literary things. And so it loses some of, um, uh, some of, the, some of the passion. But Eliza Harriet is, um, uh, is sort of straddling, um, straddling that uh, line. And, um, and she, she doesn't seem to be, um, you know, she kind of gets away with it a little bit. Um, people, people seem okay with it. She, she does deliver, very importantly, the oration of the prayer by Demosthenes, which is sort of the great male um, piece of oratory. And uh, so she's straddling the line, but, but she's a little bit careful. She also gives, you know, like the poems, the love poems of Petrarch. So she's, um, she's pretty careful about, you know, she takes a big step forward, but maybe not as big. Um, a little bit later, uh, women, particularly around um, anti-slavery and early civil rights, will um, will take the stage, and that's where um, uh, sort of women speaking in public becomes a very important aspect of early 19th century reform efforts. And so you think of someone like um, uh, Maria Stewart, right, who's giving these very significant, uh, important um, arguments uh, about the end of slavery, the beginning of early civil rights um, in Boston in this period. And so she's part of that um, uh, she's part of that movement, but but there are reports. Um, you know, some uh, women speakers in the 19th century had bodyguards who had to kind of protect them from uh, from the harassment, and and they start getting har harassed more. But we don't know that completely about Eliza Harriet. Thank you so much for those incredible answers, Professor Builder. I will pass it back to Gina to finish off the program. Yes, hi, and for everyone who didn't get their question answered, you can purchase the book in our bookshop and get your questions answered through there. And as always, please submit your student questions, a chance for middle and high school students to win a $50 gift certificate for your teacher and for yourself. And just a couple other announcements we wanted to make. The Gilder Lerman Lincoln Prize this year will be awarded to Carolyn Janney for her book, Ends of War, The Unfinished Fight, Lee's Army. And this was featured in a previous uh, book break. So we hope you will go back and watch that as well. And she'll be honored on Thursday, April 14th. And the live stream will begin at 7.50 p.m. So if you're interested in attending this event, you can email us uh, at the address on the screen. And just a couple other quick reminders. Uh, again, please purchase the book today through our bookshop because the affiliate commission we receive supports our programming for history teachers all over the world and other students as well. And next week, you can join us with John Avalon discussing his book, Lincoln and the Fight for Peace. Professor Belder, thank you again. This was such a great conversation. Oh, it was wonderful. And you always have the best questions. So um, uh, that and I'm easy to find by email. So honestly, uh, anybody who wants to email me should just reach out, email me um, uh, with questions. I'm happy to write people back with things like that. So yeah, and really encouraging teachers to utilize this book in their classes, because it's I think a not a history that's taught a lot and should be. Thanks so much. I had a great time. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.